that we serve a powerful Savior, that he has the power to raise the dead, to heal the broken. And we pray, Lord, that as we hear the word proclaimed this morning, that you would work in our hearts to surrender to that Savior, to follow him as Lord, to serve him until he returns. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Over the last several weeks, uh, Amy and I have been training our three children not to merely skim over uh, passages in the scripture each morning in order to check the I read my Bible box. But we've been training them to, to really pick apart passages of the scripture that they read each morning. And we've been doing that by teaching them to read through books of the Bible verse by verse. And in light of the overall context of the book and, and what they know already about the Bible, to ask and answer seven questions about the particular passage that they've been reading so that they might be able to better understand and apply the scriptures to their lives. As a father, I, th I think part of raising my children in the fear and admonition of the Lord is helping them to understand and apply the word of the Lord. And to do that not only for their own benefit, but to do that someday, hopefully, for the benefit of their children, should the Lord choose to bless them and provide, the, provide children of their own. Of course, you know I'm not only a father to my children, I'm a pastor to this church. And according to Ephesians chapter 4, as one of the pastors of this church, my task is to equip each of you to be those who are able to build up the body of Christ. And certainly part of that task involves helping the members of this body to understand and apply the scriptures to your own lives so that you can more effect effectively build up the body of Christ that he has been pleased to put around each of you. I told you we've been training our children not to skim over passages of the Bible. Well, this morning we've come to a passage in the book of Acts that for a number of reasons would be very easy to skim over. One of those reasons is the sense of deja vu that you might feel as you're reading through this morning's passage, having gone through the book of Acts. As we read through this morning's passage, much of what we're going to hear and much of what you will hear will sound like things we've already heard in our journey through the book of Acts. And so if someone was reading this on their own, there could certainly be a temptation to just quickly skim over it, especially given the newness and the importance of what awaits us in chapter 10. We've just heard about this massive story of Saul's conversion in chapter 8. Chapter 10 is one of the most significant chapters in, in all of the book of Acts. And so we might be tempted just to jump ahead and say, I want to hear about that. But of course, you have pastors who are committed to preaching through books of the Bible, verse by verse. And so we're not going to skim, up, skim over this passage. In fact, we're going to do the exact opposite. We're going to pick it apart. We're going to pick it apart by asking seven questions that I've been teaching my children to ask certainly in an effort to better understand and apply this scripture to our hearts this morning, but hopefully also as a way of equipping each of you, putting a tool in your tool belt, and I pray hopefully equipping others through you to be better students of God's word and more faithful followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if you haven't yet, I want to invite you to go ahead and turn with me to Acts chapter 9 in your Bible. It's page 918 in the Pew Bible. Acts chapter 9, and this morning we're going to be looking at verses 32 to 43, but for starters, I'm just going to read the first portion of the passage from verse 32 down through verse 35, so you can follow along in your copy of God's Word as I read it aloud to you. Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 32, now as Peter went here and there among them all, he came down also to the saints who lived at Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, bedridden for eight years, who was paralyzed. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose. And all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Now before I start Picking apart that passage with you this morning, I want to give you the seven questions that we're going to use, the seven questions that I've been training my children to ask as they approach different passages of Scripture. 
And if you're taking notes this morning, usually I like to sort of write these down on the left side of my page. Each question is only one word. So I like to kind of write them down on the left side of my page or on the top of my page, and then just leave a whole bunch of space to fill in the answers to the questions. So without further ado, the questions are the following. If you're taking notes, you can write these down. They're quite easy to remember. The questions are who, what, when, where, why, how, and then my favorite question, so what? Who, what, when, where, why, how, and so what? Those are the seven questions that we're going to be using as we move through our passage this morning. So take your eyes back to verse 32 with me. The text says, if you see it there, verse 32, Now as Peter went here and there among them all, he came down also to the saints who lived at Lydda. Now, this first verse, it is full of answers to our questions. First, you have some information related to the who question. You'll remember that recently we've been talking an awful lot about Saul. And we're going to come back to Saul in chapter 11. We're going to hear how, remember, Saul went to Tarsus. And we're going to hear how Saul was planting churches as he went to Tarsus. Saul wasn't on vacation. Saul went and started planting churches in the region of Tarsus. But for now... You see in verse 32 that we're back to Peter. We've kind of going, been going back and forth between them. Now we're back to Peter. And so under the who category, I'd simply start by writing Peter. Next, you get some information as to when the events of this particular section occurred. The text tells us, as Peter went here and there among them all. And so that's what you could put under the when column, as Peter went here and there among them all. But of course, if you're paying attention... That actually leads you back to another who question. Because you wonder, you say, well, who was Peter going here and there among? Who are these them all that are talked about in verse 32? And from the surrounding context in our passage, we know that Peter was going here and there among the followers of Jesus in Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. We know that because that's where we finished last week in verse 30. You remember we were talking about the peace that the believers in Judea and Galilee and Samaria had after the departure of Saul. Now, we're told in this passage that Peter was going here and there among them. And so under the who category, to fill that out, you could write, Peter was going here and there among the believers in Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. Now, one of the questions, one of those seven questions you might ask at this point is why. Why was Peter going here and there among these believers, taking time away from Jerusalem where Peter was staying, away from the church in Jerusalem, which surely had needs? Why was Peter taking the time away from Jerusalem to travel all over these regions? Well, the answer to that question, in light of what we've already heard in the book of Acts, is presumably Peter was doing the exact same thing as he was traveling among these believers that he was doing back in Acts chapter 8 when him and John went to Samaria. In all likelihood, as Peter was going here and there among these believers, he was preaching the word of God to them. That's what we saw him doing in Samaria when he traveled there with the apostle John. He's probably doing the same thing here, helping to build these believers up in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. You remember we heard about how that was taking place in the churches of Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. Well, here's how that was taking place. They were being built up through the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. You remember many of these believers in these regions had recently come to faith through the gospel proclamation of those who had been scattered from the Jerusalem church during Saul's persecution. Many of these believers in Judea and Galilee and Samaria were relatively new believers. They, they had recently experienced a new birth through faith in Jesus. They were spiritual infants. They needed to be fed good food. They, they needed to be taught how to eat and how to walk for themselves. They needed regular encouragement and support as they learned to do those things. They needed to be directed away from the danger that they might occasionally wander into. You know how infants like to wander into danger. Well, 
Same thing here. They needed to be directed away from that. You see, that's why Peter took the time to go here and there among them, so that those who had been born again might be built up. Brothers and sisters, what was true in Peter's day is still true today. We talked about the importance of discipleship last week, and here we see the importance of it, the priority of it, in Peter's life. Now, usually I like to hold on to the so what until the end, but already under the so what question, you could write the born again need to be built up. It's what we see in verse 32. Now, with that said, the last thing we see in verse 32 is an answer to the where question. You notice that Peter's no longer in Jerusalem. We're past phase one of Jesus' promise to the apostles back in chapter one. Notice Peter's also not in Samaria any longer. He had already spent significant time building them up alongside the apostle John. Instead, verse 32 tells us that Peter is in Lydda. Now, unless you are one of those people who's just up on your Holy Land geography. I'll help you out a little bit. Lydda is a city in the region of Judea. It sits just to the northwest of Jerusalem on the flatlands or the plains that were known as Sharon. So understand this. Here's the apostle Peter bearing witness in Judea, just as Jesus had promised back in chapter 1. And so perhaps next to the so what question, you could also write, Jesus is faithful to his promises. Let's move on to verse 33. On verse 33, we hear even more information that we can put under the who category. Verse 33 tells us that while visiting the believers in Lydda, Peter found a man named Aeneas. And according to the text, Aeneas was a man who had been paralyzed and bedridden for eight years. It's possible that he was a believer. There's certainly an argument that because Peter ran into Aeneas while he was visiting the believers in Lydda, there's an argument that Aeneas was already a believer. We don't know that for 100%. But there's not much more to glean from verse 33, so let's move on to verses 34 and 35. And there we hear what happened when Peter found Aeneas. If you're taking notes under the what category... You could write, Aeneas was healed, causing many to turn to the Lord. Aeneas was healed, causing many to turn to the Lord. That's what happened. In a very quick and concise fashion, the text tells us that Aeneas was healed and that when the people of the city saw him, many turned to the Lord. Now, the text tells us that all the residents saw him and they turned to the Lord, which is common language that Luke uses often. It's hyperbolic language. It's not to say that every single resident of Lydda and Shara turned to the Lord. It's just Luke's way of saying a whole bunch of them did. On verse 34, we also get some information to put under the how category, specifically how Aeneas was healed. And under the how category, you could simply write this. You could say, in the exact same way that the man born lame was healed in chapter 3. Do you remember the man born lame? That man back in chapter 3 that Peter came up to outside the temple. He was begging for alms, and he asked Peter for some alms, and, and Peter responded to him. He said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. And he said these words, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. They're almost the exact same words we see Peter speaking here in our passage, and the text says that when Peter came upon Aeneas, he, he told him, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. You could even go back to Luke chapter 5, when Jesus healed the paralytic. You remember that story when the paralytic was lowered through the roof in front of the Pharisees and the crowds? Jesus spoke to the man, and he said the following words. He said, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. Same words. And just like the man who was lowered through the roof and the man born lame outside the temple, perhaps sensing the strength returning to his legs, we're told how Aeneas responded to these words by rising and making his bed. An act of faith that demonstrated that he had been truly healed by Jesus. Now listen. A made bed in some of the houses represented here this morning would certainly be a demonstration that something miraculous had happened. <laughs> 
But how much more so in the case of Aeneas, who had no ability or need to make his bed. He had never left it for eight years. Here was evidence that Aeneas had truly been healed by Jesus. Now, so what? So what? We get to the end of this this passage and we, we say, so what? Well, let me suggest three more things that could go under the so what category for this part of the passage. Number one, Peter hadn't gone rogue. Peter hadn't gone rogue. Here we see that Jesus was continuing to do his healing work through Peter in Judea, just as he had worked through Peter in Jerusalem with a man born lame and so many others. This is just more evidence that the promise from Jesus in Acts chapter 1 was continuing to advance and that Peter was going to continue to play a significant role in that advance. Number two under the so what category, Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. I want you to notice the crowds in Jerusalem who saw the man born lame and the crowds in Lydda who saw Aeneas walking came to the same conclusion. Why did they come to that conclusion? Well, Isaiah chapter 35, beginning in verse 4, the prophet Isaiah wrote this. We, we mentioned this back in Acts chapter 3. Isaiah 35 says, your God will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be open and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. As the residents of Lydda saw Aeneas walking about, they saw evidence that the scripture had been fulfilled, at least in part, that the Lord God himself had come down in the person of Jesus to bring salvation and healing to his people. They see Jesus heal Aeneas through Peter, and they confess him as Lord, as God who came down to save them. A third addition to the so what category You could say that those who are powerfully renewed through Jesus demonstrate evidence of that renewal that points others to Jesus. Those who are renewed through Jesus demonstrate evidence of that renewal that points others to Jesus. Brothers and sisters, what was true of Aeneas whose legs were renewed through Jesus will also be true of those whose hearts have been renewed by Jesus. The evidence will be there, as will the opportunity to tell others how it is they see what they see. Now, if you're taking notes at this point, maybe you can draw a line across your page and you can write the seven questions again. We're going to turn to the second part of our passage now, and I'm going to pick up reading in verse 36 and read down through the end of the chapter. Verse 36, now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days, she became ill and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. She opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon, a tanner. Now you see the second part of our passage, it begins by answering the where question. Here the author has directed our attention to Joppa. It's yet another Judean city. And if you look down to verse 38, you see that Joppa was near Lydda, where we just heard that Peter had healed Aeneas. Just to the northwest of Lydda, it's on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, if you look at a map. Now, following the mention of Joppa at the beginning of verse 36, we get some information about the who category in the remainder of the verse. 
as we're introduced to a disciple named Tabitha, or Dorcas, as was her Greek name. And in spite of the unfortunate way that name sounds in the Greek, it really is a beautiful name. The the name Tabitha and the name Dorcas, both of them translate to mean gazelle in the English. And one commentator actually pointed out that if you look at the Song of Solomon, the word gazelle is actually a metaphor for the beloved. Interesting uh, take that he had. And so certainly her character that we hear about in the text, it shows the appropriateness of her name, if indeed it has to do with being beloved. She's full of good works and acts of charity, the text says. And this made her beloved among the people, as we see from the scripture. But it was also a demonstration that she was the beloved of the Lord. And not a beloved of the Lord as a result of her works, but the beloved of the Lord as demonstrated by her works. Remember, the Bible is clear that sinners are not saved by their good works, but only by God's grace through faith in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. But as Ephesians 2 verse 10 reminds us, though we are not saved by good works, we are saved for good works that God has prepared for us. According to what we see in verse 39, one of those good works that God had prepared for Tabitha and that she was engaged in was a clothes-making ministry for the widows in Joppa. Presumably, this was a ministry that she was carrying out for the widows within the church at Joppa, but we can also say this is probably something that extended beyond the church to the unbelieving widows as well. And at this point, I think you could put two things under the so what category. Number one, every disciple has good works prepared for them. And number two, widows matter. They mattered in Jerusalem. As that promise began to work itself out, they continued to matter. As the promise worked itself out in Judea, brothers and sisters, they still matter today. Now moving forward to verse 37, we take note of the when of this part of the passage. The text says, in those days, specifically as we understand from verse 38, in the days when Peter was with the believers in Lydda. Now, what happened in those days? Well, verse 37 tells us that Tabitha became ill and died, and she was washed, meaning that she was being prepared for burial, and she was laid in an upper room. Shortly after, we're told how two men were sent from the disciples in Joppa to find Peter in Lydda and to urge him to quickly return to Joppa with them. The text tells us in verse 39 that Peter had time to do that. He goes back with them to Joppa, and in verse 41, we hear the results of his coming, that like Aeneas, Tabitha rose. It's actually the exact same word that was used when Aeneas was risen. That same word, like Aeneas, Tabitha rose. And as it was in Lydda, so it was in Joppa. Many in this Judean city, we're told, responded to what had happened by becoming followers of Jesus, believing in him as the text reads in verse 42. The passage then closing with a note that Peter stuck around for many days in the house of a tanner named Simon. Let's back up for a minute. How was Tabitha raised? Well, verse 40 tells us that upon arriving, Peter asked everyone to leave, just as Luke 8 tells us that Jesus did when he came to see Jairus' daughter. After everyone left, Peter prayed. And then the text tells us that like Jesus did with Jairus' daughter, Peter spoke to the body of Tabitha. Now it's interesting that when Peter speaks to the body of Tabitha, he does so in almost an identical way that Jesus spoke to the body of Jairus' daughter. The words that we heard from Mark chapter 5 a little earlier. You remember the words that Jesus spoke to Jairus' daughter? He said, Talitha kumi. Talitha meaning little girl, kumi meaning arise. Here in our passage, Peter changes one letter. He says, Tabitha kumi, Tabitha, arise. Now, why did all this happen? 
Well, the first reason that's clear from the text is to make much of Jesus in this Judean city. Jesus not only had the power to restore a man physically, he also had the power to raise the dead. Clearly, when Peter comes to Joppa and he enters into the upper room, he's just doing what he saw Jesus do. He's carrying on the work of Jesus in this city of Judea. He's not looking for any sort of accolades for himself. He doesn't say, uh, Tabitha, in the name of Jesus Christ, I heal you. No, it's all about Jesus speaking the same words. Even what he said to Aeneas, he says, Jesus Christ heals you. He's carrying on that work, making much of Jesus. Peter does one thing differently. The text says he prayed. But even that serves to exalt Jesus. Peter doesn't have the ability to do this on his own. This is only through the power of Christ and the will of God that this woman is healed. The true healer in this story is Jesus. Furthermore, you see from the response in Joppa that it was Jesus, not Peter, who's getting the glory for this raising of Tabitha. They're not going around saying, you got to come and see this this Peter guy and what he did. No, no, no. They're saying, you have to trust Jesus. Look at what he can do. There's another reason why all this happened, and that was to set the stage for what was about to take place next. We're going to hear about this next week as we come to Acts chapter 10. You see that our passage this morning, it it sort of ends in a strange way. It tells us that Peter is staying with this guy named Simon who's a tanner. We we don't hear anything about where he's staying in Lydda. And so it's kind of interesting. Why Why would we get this information about Simon being a tanner? But when we pick up next week in chapter 10, we're going to hear how it was on the roof of Simon's house that Peter would receive a vision from the Lord to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And so the story is continuing, and that's part of what's going on. But before we come to chapter 10 and before we get to next week, I think there's two important things that we need to see. Number one, as we said earlier, it's important to see that Peter is doing the Lord's work. And what he is being given the ability to do is only advancing the promise that Jesus had given back in chapter 1. But here's the second thing I think is important to remember. It's important to see that walls were already starting to be broken down as the gospel continued its advance. Now, what do I mean by walls were already starting to be broken down? Well, verse 43 tells us that Peter stayed with this man named Simon for many days while he was in Joppa. So it would seem from his extended hospitality to Peter that Simon was probably a believer. But the the author highlights something different about Simon. He highlights the fact that Simon was a tanner. Now a tanner was involved in the leather making business and, and his business required him to be in contact with the bodies of dead animals. And therefore this was the kind of person that stricter Jews would have considered unclean and that others would have just, frankly, avoided because the, the stench and the filth associated with this work just made them look a certain way, made them smell a certain way. And so even if they didn't care if he was unclean, I don't even want to go near that guy. In fact, history shows that tanners were required to live a certain distance outside of Jewish cities because of the stench associated with their work. They had to be downwind So the stench didn't come into the city. Now, Peter was a fisherman, and so perhaps the stench wasn't as as big of a thing for Peter. But still, he's staying in Simon's house. This man who is basically a religious and a social outcast in Joppa and in Jewish life as a whole. Given that Peter stayed with him for many days, apparently this wasn't an issue that he was considered unclean by others, as it would have been for some other Jews. But this also wasn't the last wall that God was going to break down as the gospel was going forward. 
There was a far bigger wall that God wanted to bring down, a wall that Peter would struggle to overcome, and one that he would even have to be confronted about by the Apostle Paul, as we read in Galatians 2. Peter was able to overcome this wall of a stinky and supposedly unclean tanner, but he would have a little bit more difficulty overcoming the wall between Jews and Gentiles. Peter staying with a tanner wasn't so hard, but Peter going to the Gentiles? That was a challenge. That was going to press Peter. Some things that had been ingrained in Peter since he was a child. That was going to challenge those things. And something we're going to hear more about in chapter 10 as we enter into the passage next week. But at this point, we've come to the end of the morning passage and we've read it, we've picked it apart, we've used the seven questions I gave you, but as we always tell our children, we're not done yet. Before we step away, we need to consider all that we've heard and all that we've read and how we should respond. What is this passage calling us to do? And with the time we have left, I want to suggest three things this passage calls for. Number one, there's a call to be saved. As people in Lydda and Joppa became aware of what happened to Aeneas and Tabitha, the text says that many turned to the Lord Jesus Christ and believed in him. Well, brothers, sisters, and friends, this morning, each of us have once again become aware of what happened to Aeneas and Tabitha. This isn't some made-up story. This is a historical account that was written by Luke only 20 years after the event. If someone wanted to go and disprove this event, all they would have to do is go to Lydda and Joppa and ask anyone around and say, did this really happen? Of course, if they did, they would have come back and said, no, nah, Luke was making that up. Peter told a tale. That's not what happened. These events really happened. And they were a demonstration that Jesus has the power to raise the dead and to renew broken bodies. Even so, eventually, Aeneas and Tabitha's time on this earth would come to an end and both of them would die. But not without hope. For what they had experienced in being raised by Jesus the first time was only a foretaste of what Jesus would do again. For Jesus said that a day is coming when he will raise the dead. And on that day, all who have turned from their sin and believed in him will receive a renewed physical body in a new heavens and a new earth where the effects of sin and death will be felt no more. And as we have noted, Jesus is faithful to his promises. This morning, if you're not a follower of Jesus, God has seen fit to allow you to hear this once more, to become aware of the power of Jesus to raise the dead and to renew what is broken in this fallen world. The Bible says that our sin has separated us from God and it's the reason that we experience suffering and death in this fallen world. But through Jesus, through the one who has power, there's hope. He came down from heaven to reconcile sinners like us to a holy God. He lived a life that was perfect and without sin. In accord with the Father's plan, he died on a Roman cross, not because he was a sinner, but because we are sinners. He died as our substitute. Three days later, he rose from the dead as a demonstration of his power once again over death. And still this morning, the call goes out to turn to this Lord Jesus Christ in repentance and faith. Trust that he is the Savior who reconciles us to God. Turn from your sins and follow Jesus as Lord. Friend, if God has graciously worked that desire in you, you will not only be reconciled to God, but when Jesus comes again, your body will be raised and renewed to enjoy eternal life that Jesus won for you through his life, death, and resurrection. Oh, that today might be the day of salvation for someone sitting here this morning. If that's you, you can come and find me or Pastor Andrew after the service. Tell us what the Lord has done in your heart. Tell us, I, I desire to follow this Lord. I see the power that he has over sin and death, and I want to follow him because I recognize I'm a sinner who's going to the grave. And without him, I have no hope. 
But in Christ, through faith in him, we do. There's a second call from the passage. Not just a call to be saved, but a call to serve. Three things we should notice. The believers in this passage were used. Their works were varied, but their priority was clear. In this passage, we have Peter, Aeneas, Tabitha, and Simon, all being used by the Lord, albeit in very different ways, eager to use whatever the Lord had given to them to serve the Lord and his people. We see Peter using his time to build up the body of Christ through preaching and teaching. We see Aeneas using his renewed legs to be a walking billboard for Jesus, probably becoming a very effective evangelist as people asked him how this was possible. Tabitha, using certain skills and resources that she had in order to care for the widows, although the text implies that she certainly generously served in many other ways as well. She's full of good works and charity, the text says. Simon, using his home, opening up his home, demonstrating hospitality to Peter so that Peter could continue to build up the believers in Joppa and the gospel could continue to advance. Rest assured, if you are a believer, the Lord has given you abilities and he has given you work to do. Now, I know a few of you are looking at me and saying, well, pastor, I'm not sure how much I can do anymore. Maybe you can't do all the things that you used to do. But that doesn't mean what you can still do is any less important. I read an article this week that was actually written by a shut-in. Someone who, due to health restrictions, was confined to his home. He couldn't get out. And oftentimes, when you read articles about shut-ins, it's encouragements as as to how the shut-in might be served by the church. This man took it upon himself to write an article about how a shut-in, like himself, could serve the church. He was eager to serve the Lord and his people, and he was engaged in some hugely significant ministry as a result. Here's some ways he said the Lord was using him. He said, I use my time to pray for the church and his pastors. My pastors tell me all the time to pray for them, and so I use my time to do that. He said, I use my home to invite church members over so that I can hear their testimonies and learn about their lives and know how I might encourage them and pray for them throughout the week. He said, I use my phone. Occasionally, I'll I'll call the members of the church and I'll check in with them to see how they're doing. I'll follow up on certain prayer requests and offer a word of encouragement to them if the Lord gives it to me. He said, I use my finances. I'm not going to make a big deal of this, but he said, I use my finances and I, I support the work of the ministry. And friends, that's an important way that believers are used as well. Even as a shut-in, this man had the mindset of a humble servant seeking to make much of Jesus and to use whatever abilities and resources God had given to him to serve his Lord and to build up his body. The result being that he was used by the Lord in significant ways. And brothers and sisters, he had work to do. He believed that promise from Ephesians chapter 2, that he was saved and that the Lord had prepared good works for him. And he knew that because he had breath in his lungs like Aeneas, the Lord wasn't done with him yet. There was still work for him to do. And brothers and sisters, you and I have work to do as well. It won't look the same for all of us. Some of us will spend more of our time in the ministry of the word. Some of us will spend a good bit of our time caring for the physical needs of the body with the abilities that God has given to us. Some of us may have the gift of hospitality or the gift of encouragement and will be used by the Lord in other ways. Every bit of it is important. The body of Christ has many members, the scriptures say. Each member functioning according to its purpose for the good of the whole. If you're a part of Christ's body, you have a purpose. Trust that is true. Humbly consider how you might be used to serve the Lord and his people. Seek out your pastors if you need help discerning what that might be. And then most importantly, make time to be engaged in those good works, whatever they may be.
It's interesting that when people came to Peter and they said, hey, come with me urgently, Peter didn't say, I don't have time for that. He went. Clearly, Tabitha was taking time and being very intentional to prioritize her service in the church. Make time. As Paul said in Ephesians 2, God has prepared good works that we may walk in them. Not just that we know what them or that we seek out what they may be, but that we may walk in those good works. Here's the third and final call of this passage. A call to surrender. To surrender whatever prejudices we may hold. Jesus is faithful to his word. But trusting his word will call us to knock down some walls. Jesus promised that his people will be a people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. People from different countries, with different customs, with different backgrounds. His people will consist of men and women, rich and poor, in this country, from this country. His people will consist of those who voted for Biden in 2020, and those who voted for Trump, and those who didn't care. Those who wore masks during COVID, and those who didn't. We live in a world that loves to break us into categories and make judgments about those who aren't like us. But the gospel says there's only two categories that matter, in Christ or not. When we see those who are different from us, who fit into another category according to the world system, who think differently on a non-essential matter than we do, that is all that should matter to us. Are they in Christ? or not. If they are in Christ, we love them like the family that they are. And if they are not in Christ, we love them by sharing the gospel with them and drawing near to them. Prejudices are a distraction from that reality, and they are a hindrance to the Lord's calling to love others as we love ourselves. And so this morning, maybe it's time for us to consider, do we have any of those prejudices that have been ingrained in us Are you tempted to avoid certain people or to make judgments about people based on the way they look, the place they're living, the way they dress, or the job they have? Brothers and sisters, holding on to such prejudices will only hinder your usefulness and harm Christ's body. The gospel calls us to surrender them. My prayer is that God would give us the grace to do just that, to respond to these three calls this morning, to surrender our prejudices, to serve the Lord and his people with whatever abilities and resources God has given to us, and to be saved this morning through faith in Jesus, if you have not. Father, we pray that you would give us the grace to do these things, to respond in faith to these calls. We pray, Father, that as we do, your church body would be built up, not only through those who come to salvation through Jesus and join us in membership here, but those who are already members of this church, that they too would be built up through the ways that you call your people to serve them and through the good works that you have prepared for each of us. Help us to be faithful to that. Help us to make time for that. Help us to believe that you can still use us. If you can use Aeneas and you're not done with him yet, then you're not done with anyone who's sitting here this morning either. Help us to trust that and help us to walk in these good works that you have prepared for the glory of Jesus and him alone, in whose name we pray. Amen.